get started. So, <clears throat> is that okay? Do you want me to turn off any of the lights? Is it too? Listen, I didn't turn the lights on last um, on Monday at all in here. So, um, what I'm going to do at the start of every lecture is I review the last topic and it's really important to pay attention to this uh, re review portion because I really um, focus on what you should have learned or what you should know by now to kind of like move forward so it's a nice place to check in. And just as a reminder, this course is normally I use clicker questions during this time and um, the clicker questions are also a form of this review. So um, try to really think about this stuff because you're not getting those clicker questions, which are really helpful. So let's talk a little bit about topic one. Um, the first thing that we did in topic one um, is we started to get familiar with the MATLAB environment and all the shortcuts you can use within the command window. Um, and hopefully after using it for the pre-lab and lab, you're just starting to get a feel for that. That's kind of the goal of, of topic one. Um, the next thing that a lot of people start to figure out at this time is that code only reads from top to bottom and then each line reads from left to right. And so if you define a variable on line 13 and then you are trying to use that variable on line 1, the variable will be unknown to line 1. So the only thing that gets tricky about this is if you start writing, running your M file within your command window over and over again, what you'll notice is that those those variables got put in your workspace. So then your code is reading from top to bottom, but it's also accessing everything from your workspace. So occasionally it can be confusing why it knows about a variable that was defined at the bottom of the file. And that is why we need to be making sure that we type clear all at the top of our file. Because you always want your file to run from a clear slate because you're always going to be moving files around and using them in different places or sending them to me and so you want to know what it's like to run it for the first time and so that's why we need that clear all at the top. The next thing we learned is that you need to put a semicolon at the end of every single line to suppress the output that gets printed to the screen. This is a standard programming technique um, because otherwise anything that you actually want to be able to see or look at won't be visible because everything else is just toggle like toggling the whole screen through so you won't be able to see what you want to see so you suppress everything and you only show the things that you specifically need to see um, right now we're going to be using display statements to make them look nice and when you get to the end of a code where you're kind of done that's the best way to do it but if you're if you're working on the code or or you know working on these Cody courseworks you can just unsuppress the line to look at the output um, that's fine so the next thing and I actually this is, I unfortunately don't get to see a lot of you as you kind of work through some of these things but this is a very typical mistake I see around this time which is that um, the code always reads from the equal sign over and then places whatever was calculated into the variable so as a result, if you want to define a variable, you have to put the variable first, the equal sign next, and then whatever you want to place inside that variable. You cannot do it in the opposite way. Um, and so as a result, equal signs are reserved to define variables. That's what an equal sign is, is, is used for. And you'll notice later in the semester we're going to use an equality to check if two things are equal and that has a different symbol. So an equal sign is only used for definitions. And then the last thing that, that I have here on this slide is that you started to figure out the syntax of disp and fprintf. Display is another one. It's the same as disp um, for the most part. Uh, but the two that have different syntaxes that you were kind of exploring is disp and fprintf. Um, so we also started to look at different data types. So we really are going to be using two in this class. So the first type is um, what comes out as a default when you define a variable as a number. So if I say equals 53.4657, that data type that's going to, 
de um, by default be saved as is um, a floating point number. And that means that the decimal is included in the precision. If I instead chose it to be an integer, which is not default, you'd have to use that int8 or some other um, command. Uh, then the number would just be saved as a 10 um, for these two examples. But if you just define it like this, like I did here, um, the default is just the floating point number, and it's the biggest one, 64 bits. Um, it can hold any amount of precision you would ever need. And then the other type of data type that we've been using is character strings or text. We use those mainly to describe what it is that we're trying to program. So um, the reason it's important to understand the two different data types is because we often need to combine them in dis statements or titles. And so we learned the two, these two syntaxes. One is dis. So disp requires parentheses because it is a function and all functions require parentheses to insert something into them. B is the string here, surface area is, and I'm concatenating that with A because I want it to say surface area is 53.4657. But those are two different data types and arrays don't allow mixed data types, so you have to convert the number into a string, and then if you combine them in an array using these square brackets, which we're going to talk about a lot today, with a comma in between, um, it allows them to be combined. So that's how disp works. Again, I'm going to revisit that after I talk about arrays, but this is just, if you just want to memorize the syntax, parentheses at square bracket, num to string with a comma in between. And then fprintf, totally different. You put the string first. And then wherever you want to place the value that the variable holds, you put a percentage sign. And then everything after the percentage sign is just formatting. Okay, and the last thing I'm going to show you every time, and this is a really useful, um, and I'll post these slides that I'm showing um, as PDFs um, on D2L. But uh, when I go over these tips and tricks, um, part of the exam, which you'll see when I go over the format of the exam, is a debugging section. So I give you debugging questions, so questions um, that show you some code and then show you what the error message is, and then you have to fix it. And so um, these, these are the most common errors that almost all of you have seen, and rarely does anyone see anything beyond what I show you, because they're pretty much all the same. Um, so here's one that I didn't see anyone ha having this time, but I typically do, which is um, the idea that you can overwrite a variable. So let's say you used, this happens a lot with some of the intrinsic functions like max, mean, and min. Those are the names of the functions, and so when someone is trying to find a max, oftentimes they want to use the variable max, because it just makes sense, right? But then it overwrites the function. So if you, over, if, you, if you take a function, disp, and you overwrite it with one, um, then the error message makes no sense. It won't tell you, oh, you overwrote the intrinsic function. Typically what it says is it says that you're trying to access an index that doesn't exist in the disp function um, because you're trying to put a string into the disp function, which is now just one, and so it's trying to access some string value of one. So it's a very confusing error message. So if something really weird is happening and you don't get it, like it's not just like, oh, this variable name is spelled wrong or something like that, always check that you haven't overwritten an intrinsic function. It happens way more often than you think because sometimes you can overwrite it in your workspace, not in your code, and then it's still using it from the workspace. The other one that I think, and this is, this is a really easy one to find, is uh, anytime it says undefined function or variable, uh, something usually tells you what it was. So I'm running a code called test code, and my error message says undefined function or variable, F-R-I-D. Probably misspelled this, either by whatever you originally defined that variable or whatever intrinsic function. Um, but this is a very common error, and it's a very easy one to read because it tells you which variable it doesn't recognize. And so you need to go back and look at um, what's inconsistent about that. I don't think I talked about this last time, but it was in the pre-lab. So remember, this will happen a lot um, in future labs. If you, and I don't have this many tips each topic, this is a lot of tips for the first one, but if you um, 
don't see the double arrows and you're kind of stuck running a code if a code uh, if a code is running and it it doesn't give you back the arrows meaning that it's done running um, remember to press control C what I see a lot of people doing is just shutting down their computer or shutting down MATLAB to get it out of its frozen state but you you it all happens all the time you just have to press control C and that's on all um, operating systems and then the last thing is that at the top of every file, make sure you get in the habit of typing close all, clear all. Um, and close all won't make sense into plotting, but it's good practice. Okay.